Clara Casus was a little girl. She saw a live elephant that shaped her life's work. A little bit later, we'll see that story. Dr. Casus is an actor, an academic, and also a real knight. The French Ministry of Culture named her a knight of arts and letters. Guilla uses drama to teach about genocide and slavery and promote justice and peace. She is a strong voice for gender equality. Guilla says the time has come to stop being afraid and accept that we can become our own saviors. Her remarkable panel of healers and artists are restoring a sense of humanity to refugees. I am proud to introduce Guilla Clara Casus, UNESCO Artist for Peace. Thank you very much, dear Michael, for this beautiful introduction. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is my privilege to begin this roundtable about a very important topic today, which is the role of the artists in peace building. As you know, artists have a lot to say and especially have a lot to teach us. And today to discuss this, we will discuss with two people, I would say from the academical side and two people from the ground side. And we will see that actually thinkers and doers are very mingling each other. And you will see how they are doing good job in terms of this notion of artistically changing the world, thanks to a very thoughtful peace building. With me today, I have four wonderful participants. Uh, the first person I would like to say hello to is Dr. Richard Molika. Dr. Richard Molika, thank you for being with us. So you're a professor of psychiatry, MD, at Harvard University, Harvard Medical School, exactly. And you are the director of the Harvard Program and Refugees Trauma Massachusetts General Hospital. Thank you so very much for being with us. And I would like you to maybe take a few seconds to explain us a little bit more about what you're doing and your profession. And maybe you can share one image, something that you want in order for us to better understand and get into uh, your artistic world. Our program in two seconds is, <clears throat> this is our 40th, 40th anniversary. We were founded as one of the first refugee clinics in the United States in December of 1981. And since then, in the Boston area, locally, we've seen over 10,000 survivors of torture, mass violence, sexual violence, rape, etc. But we've also had a big experience in Cambodia. We've been in Cambodia since 1990, the refugee camps, and then Cambodia since 1990. We've been in Peru. We've been in Lebanon. Uh, we've been in Liberia. Uh, and uh, we, we've worked in the earthquake zones in Japan. And, and, and the bottom line in Australia, et cetera, we've been in Australia with the Aboriginal community. And the bottom line is that everywhere we've worked, we've never worked there as kind of, um, we didn't come in from the outside. In other words, all our work internationally has been with local partners, 100%. Excellent. So, so that, that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. And, and when we talk about the arts, you know, we, we really privilege, the bottom line is our saying in our clinic I mean, how do you listen to 10,000 stories of rape, murder, torture, disappearance, et cetera, without losing your mind? And uh, we say clearly that there's no healing without beauty. That's our mm -hmm. model. So the HPRT model is there's no healing without beauty. Thank you. There's no healing without beauty. It's a beautiful motto. And Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Dr. Richard Molika, uh, you will have also uh, the joy uh, to discuss with Professor Nisha Sajani, whom you know, who is the director of the program in drama therapy, chair of the Creative Arts Therapies Consortium and International Research Alliance. You're also the founder of the Arts and Health Initiative at New York University. Um, Professor Sajani, thank you so much for joining. So you are, you know, the second um, academic person here thinking about the role of the artist in peace building. Can you tell us a little more concretely what you're doing 
And um, I was thinking of sharing this image in order for people to really fully understand what you're doing. Oh, well, this image, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's wonderful to see you again, Richard, as well. I've had the pleasure of collaborating with the HPRT for many years, and uh, that motto has really stayed with me. There's no healing without beauty. And um, this this image here is from a recent trip with a group of artists, uh, the Campfire Project, with a, a group of artists and arts therapists who uh, had been mobilized um, after the Syrian refugee crisis uh, and had actually been working in Ritzona, a refugee camp in Greece. But here, this image is from our recent trip to Moldova, close to the border of Ukraine, where we were working with children and uh, with mothers primarily, um, who had been staying in shelters now six months after the war uh, or in into the war rather, to provide a bit of levity, a bit of joy, uh, and opportunities for different forms of expression, both for children and youth uh, and, and the mums. Um, and so that's this gives you a little sense of the work that I'm doing. I'm both on the ground and I work as a researcher, of course, taking a look at what exactly are the health benefits of the arts with a variety of communities, but specifically with people who've been forcibly displaced. And I'll just say it's an area that's very close to my heart because my mother and my father, my, my family uh, had lived through the partition of India and Pakistan and they were refugees themselves for three years in Agra before relocating to Malaysia and then to Canada. And I grew up in Canada. I grew up with a certain degree of safety uh, and the privilege of that, but I carry with me the inheritance of that story as well and have sought to uh, to unite my, my love of creativity in the arts with, uh, with care for communities that seek a space of belonging. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very special uh, sharing with us. Uh, thank you. And as I said at the beginning, we have two academic and two, I would say, doers, but you will see that the doer and the thinkers are together. And the two academic people here are professors and, and also uh, scholars are really doing a lot on the ground. Another person who is doing a lot on the ground is our next uh, panelist. Uh, her name is Eloise Onumba Bessonet. She is a victimologist specializing in sexual violence in armed conflicts with the Loba Association. So as a project manager for recreation by Loba, you will tell us all about Loba. Eloise, welcome and thank you for being here. I will share with you um, a very important uh, image, I think, uh, that is coming from your work. And maybe you can tell us a little more about it. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much to invite me. That's definitely a pleasure. Um, with LOBA, we, pro we offer to women a victim of violence um, dance therapy workshop during two hours. And we, we basically uh, are in Paris area. And this image, uh, you can see um, there is like a draw a person come to one of, one of our workshops. And, uh, and during two hours, she, she took and she drew a lot of, uh, of, of drawing and stuff. And she, she, she gave these three sentences. It was get right of frustration. And definitely, and it, it was definitely a very important image for us because the woman we was, uh, she was picking wear a, a short gold power. And that's definitely the, the, the picture of we want in our association LOBA. And definitely uh, our workshop help them to, to, to have a better confidence in themselves. And definitely the goal of our workshop is to develop the empowerment of those women through dance. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much uh, you. for the sharing and for this uh, great job you're doing. Another artist that we welcome here is actually living in Bangladesh. Um, his name is Enayat Khan. He's a visual artist and a photographer. And so um, I want to thank you very much, Enayat, for being here. Uh, Enayat, I know that you have a translator because you are living in the refugee camp Cox's Bazar and uh, your wonderful drawing and pictures are saying so much about the terrible situation of the Rohingya right now. Um, I would like, of course, to thank uh, the translator of uh, Enayet, who is Ataram Shin, who is with us. I will share one of the pictures for people to better understand really um, the terrible, uh, terrible situation that is uh, uh, right now lived. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about Enayet, uh, Ataram, 
whenever you you speak uh, whenever you want. Evet öyle ay hondaki verir. Yanında kanso bi ziyana ay için sayı remember'de mazı la bana ilam deri. Öyle yanında mazı ay bu zeti sayıdı mani. And it is uh, saying that uh, this picture is he draw for 25 August. Uh, 25 August is one of the uh, Rohanja uh, influx, the biggest influx day. Uh, it was happened in 2017. And on 25 August, over 1 million Rohanja fled in Bangladesh. So that, that day is uh, commemorated every year as a genocide remembrance day for Rohanja. So that for this day, uh, as a his, uh, remembrance, he... Uh, he he draw this picture to express what the real situation faced in Myanmar uh, in 2017 in the biggest influx while crossing there. Like in this picture, uh, in the front side there is uh, omen shooting, and the omen is so there are a lot of uh, horrible incident. Uh, so she is uh, so scared and shooting, and uh, nearby the woman. And another woman is carrying a, a baby who is injured uh, by gunshot, and she is also scared. And uh, on the top there is one of the one of the troop, one of the military who have guns, and he is shooting. And in the incident, uh, uh, in the center there is a person carrying two older women, uh, older men uh, by uh, two uh, basket. So and While he also focused there, uh, animal are how feel when people are crowded to the border and there are violence happen and shooting. And at that time, uh, animal also escaped and they they are moving. They are not eating uh, eating grass like this situation is he is covered. And so this picture is drawn especially to remember a uh, genocide day. This uh, August. August 25. Thank you very much. Thank you. I remind we remind that Enayat is 23. Uh, only, and uh, he went through this horror uh, together with his family, and he's at Cox Bazaar right now. Thank you again for joining. Let's begin um, our questions. Um, as you see, art could be here to be transmitting, and this is what we saw with Anayat, transmitting the horror. Art can be trying to heal, and this is what uh, Dr. Malika was telling us, uh, in order to find beauty in healing. Um, especially when it comes to refugee. So uh, let's have Dr. Malika speak first. And my first question to Dr. Malika will be this one. How do you use art in order to create peace building? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you what an honor it, has, it is to be with our my fellow panelists. Thank you, panelists, for the beautiful work You know, it's a call out to the beautiful work that they do. And um, you'll see in a minute, um, you know, in, in, you know, mental health problems and health problems are rampant in people who have been violated by, uh, people have been violated by violence, also climate change and also the destruction, the animals and plants that have been tortured and destroyed by human beings in terms of ecocide, what we call ecocide. We can't forget that. So art plays, you know, Nisha, who's one of my great colleagues and beloved friends, you know, we, for years in our course in Italy with the medical school, we had people bring up healing environment, what they thought was a healing environment and art and nature came up constantly. So we, we can't separate art from nature. And you're the artist, you can talk about that. But I want to also talk about the fact that because of the deep humiliation of the people, you know, humiliation is the atomic bomb of emotion. When you humiliate people, you create terrorists, you create anger, revenge, you know, and um, this is the weapon of the violators. They use humiliation to create the state of humiliation, which is very, very hard for people to recover from. And so we have another saying in our clinic is healing is the restoration of human dignity. And Art and Nisha, I know Nisha, I don't know my other colleagues directly, but I know Nisha will speak to this, you know, is that, you know, re the restaurant, you know, 
violence, whether it's climate change, uh, terrible violence we're doing to people all over the world, like in the Ukraine, the dignity of the human being is destroyed and injured. And like the beautiful talk by our young artist here, the Rohingya artist, you know, he, he's trying to restore the dignity in the Congo, the dancing, et cetera, you know. So I wanna just show you a little project we had in Lebanon in the Becca Valley at the height of ISIS and the Assad regime killing, killing people. So uh, Fanny, can you show the, the Becca, this just take two more minutes, I'll be done. I don't wanna take a lot of time. So Fanny's gonna show you. So here's, here's a Syrian refugee camp. Okay. And the school for the children was in that refugee camp. The tenant schools under the UN was in that refugee camp. With the Gada project that was introduced by the uh, pioneering architects of the dream team, they call themselves the American University of Beirut, they decided to have the children in primary health care build their own schools. Build, can you imagine young people, in, and these are kids who were in that tented community at the top. That was their school. See the school at the top? Now you're going to see what the kids built. Next slide. So from recycled material, because wow. they're... Uh, from recycled material, the kids produce this structure. Next slide. This is the classroom they built. And then the next, and you can see the art, you know, we, in all of our clinics, we have a tremendous amount of local art from the local people, okay, and the kids. And here's the school that the children built. Now look at the difference between that and the tented school. Now at this time, and we're, we're going to end on this note, um, the kids were being recruited into ISIS out of those tented schools because they didn't go to school. It wasn't a healing environment. It wasn't a beautiful environment. It wasn't a place they wanted to be at. So we did research on this and we showed that the goddess schools had a dramatic impact on attendance uh, and school performance and the reduction in anxiety and depression. And look now, is this art? I don't know. I think it is because I, I think we're, we, we say there's no healing without beauty and everything we do Look at this compared to the Tenta School, made by the children themselves. Now, later on, we're going to talk about uh, health promotion environments being created by Liberian architects, artists, and Haitian architects and artists, and the women themselves, the people themselves. So I'll end on that note. Yes, beautiful. So the sense of aesthetic is a way to heal. And we understand also the importance in peace building of giving the autonomy of having the local population doing it itself. And that's really interesting in terms of not only caring, but really teaching them how to do without any external help. Uh, Dr. Nisha Sajani, uh, I'm going to ask you the same questions regarding this notion of how do you use art in order to create peace building. What is nice in this roundtable is that we have multiple, I would say, art represented. We just saw architecture with Dr. Malika, but you, Dr. Sajani, is all about drama and theater. Of course, with, uh, um, um, with Eloise, we have dance, and with Enayat, we have all of the graphic and the painting. But Dr. Sajani, could you tell us how do you use arts in order to uh, build peace? Certainly, and thank you for the sharing so far. I want to pick up on some of that. Um, you know, Richard's comments, Dr. Malika's comments around humiliation and dignity and thinking about how your painting, Inayat, was such a powerful example of that, of dignifying an experience, of saying, we're going to represent it, we're going to see it, we're going to hear it. Um, and 
you know, just if I could step back for a moment to just comment on this notion of beauty, um, the academic in me is thinking about Arthur Danto's notions of beauty, you know, beauty in the natural world that uh, Dr. Malika spoke about, and then beauty in representation in visual art and drama and dance and music, and then beauty in our everyday lives, that aesthetic consideration to the building of a school and architecture, to the jewelry we wear, to the, the choices we make every day to try to elevate and dignify our experience in some way that all of these are ways in which we bring in the arts and aesthetic consideration into our lives. Um, but you've asked me about theater and about drama in particular. And I would say that, you know, in, in the work that I do in New York, when I think about displacement, I think about geographic displacement, certainly as a result of war uh, and human rights violations uh, and climate change. But I also think about displacement in terms of social displacement, economic displacement, the ways in which people might feel isolated um, or cut off as a result of the color of their skin, as a result of their legal status, uh, their gender identity, uh, their sexual orientation, and so on. Um, indeed, these are many of the reasons why people are persecuted after all. And that happens within the space of a city or across countries and across those kinds of lines. So at uh, NYU, we have a therapeutic theater series where we partner with different community organizations to, part, to work alongside them to help them tell their stories. And in so doing, they have both the art form of theater and then the literal stage, a platform to elevate that story. Uh, so one of the projects we're working on this fall is a project that we are calling out patient um, with the patient part crossed off. And it's actually providers and people who have benefited from different kinds of uh, mental health care in the city telling stories about uh, life, struggle, joy, celebration. They're not all stories having to do with mental illness or despair. They're, they're stories to do with, um, with living. Uh, but the interesting thing about the project is that they are told together. They are told in partnership with people who are typically in the role of the doer, the provider, the helper, as a means of communicating to an audience that we're all in this struggle together and that we have a role to play in each other's lives. And I think this is one of the ways that theater and indeed many other art forms can contribute to peace building because Sometimes peace building is a conflict or a limitation of the imagination, or, or rather conflict is a limitation of the imagination, in that we can't imagine what it is to coexist or to cohere, you know, in the aftermath of, uh, of violence. And so this particular project and many like it are saying, let's represent this way of relating to one another that we have a hard time embodying in real life, a way of walking in partnership. So that's one of the ways I would say that we use theater to, uh, to make a difference and to contribute to peace building. Thank you so much. Limitation of imagination. I really retain this because it's uh, interesting to see that art could also be a way to imagine what could not be imagined, but that could be imagined if we want peace. So playing peace or pretending peace, thanks to theater, could lead to real peace. And I think that's uh, a very interesting way to see uh, drama therapy. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, Eloise, I'm going to ask you the same question. How do you particularly use art as a dancer in order to create peace building? Yes, thank you very much. It was definitely very, very interesting. Uh, first, I would like to present a little bit Loba. Uh, Loba exists, exists since um, 2008, more than 12 years of activity and commitment dedicated to use art as a primary tool for education, health and peace in general. Since uh, 2016, after a decisive meeting with Dr. Denis Mukwege, uh, the association creates the recreation project, uh, which consists in offering dance therapy workshop for women survivors of sexual violence. Sorry. Through our workshop, women regain power and confidence, and they learn how to rebuild their lives and how to find balance in their everyday challenges. And that's very, very important for us. We work or today we work in three hospitals in Paris uh, and in two associations to um, accompany, to, to, yeah, to accompany and, uh, and take care about women every day. Uh, dance is, is an art that really allows people to express 
and release uh, any shorts of touch, attention and feelings uh, when the words are not enough. And that's definitely the, the, the beginning point of the creation of our project. Uh, it was because the women in Democratic Republic of the Congo cannot express um, the, 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 the trauma, the sufferings. So we decided to, to use arts like this. They can, they can express um, the trauma in a different way. That, that was definitely the beginning of our workshop and our, our therapy now. So Loba also used uh, dance and other form of arts such photography, paintings uh, with high school students, men. We also work in prisons uh, in, in public spaces and ordinary citizens to work on the phenomenon of violence before even happens and try to eradicate it at the root. Do you have, uh, I, I don't know if we have it, uh, the video, what we send, what I send you, I think it could be like a good illustration, but I don't know if you if you want to to put it and in another time. Indeed, let's have a look on this movie. I don't know if, well, we can let for the beginning. So, good morning. Bonjour, ça va, mesdames? Ça va? Ça fait plaisir de vous retrouver. First, we can uh, we can say our name. Rejoice, rejoice, Queen. Queen, nice to meet you. Yeah, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. How was your week? Fine. <laughs> Some of you know the rules. The very important rule is to try to listen each other. You can share like negative things, positive things. That's definitely a sharing of experience between together. Okay, let's stretch a little your body. Okay. <laughs> Nigeria because of um, some problems and I don't wish to return there because of the problem so no I don't miss Nigeria. When I came to France I was um, I was in the street so when I came I saw that life was beyond what I thought and my life then was nothing to write about so that is not a good life at all it's like I was wasting my life. I, I want to ask you this question this workshop allow you to create some link between you. Link like which link? WhatsApp go for? Before this uh, Loba workshop, I do not know, they have not met them before, mm. but I had the opportunity to meet them, new people, you know? And we are together and we are communicating, we are sharing ideas, so we are benefiting from each other automatically. And now I'm really happy that I'm not where I used to be before. I'm still a baby, but the important thing is that I'm, I'm no longer where I used to be. A lot has changed during those times, during those years, a lot has really changed. And I see that now I have a brighter future and vision for myself than before. Lilies, patristry, cakes, croissant. Be a professional bakery. Mm. Just wish me that I can be able to actualize my dream in life, to become somebody in life. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able, he's able. Thank you very much, Eloise, for reminding us the importance of the work of Denis Mukwege. I remind that Denis Mukwege is a Nobel Prize of Peace, and he is known as uh, someone who is repairing women since he is uh, the one to take care of women, victims of sexual violence and uh, excision too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have our last panelist, Inayat Khan, uh, to answer this question of the use of arts. Inayat, how do you use arts? Uh, in order to create peace building. 
Definitely. Um, for us, it's definitely very, very important. Um, and first, uh, Loba was definitely created with the intention of, combine, of combining art with art activism. Sorry, it's difficult for me to say it. So for us, the idea was to have an organization allowing all citizens to get involved in social issues. So it was definitely how definition of artist an artist, at least in the context of our work, is a person who uses his sensitivity to communicate with the world and try to make us think, change, evolve. Uh, the artist has a very strong guiding role in the society because he has the ability to speak to everyone through uh, his medium. Help people become peace builders uh, themselves. When we look at the work uh, that we are doing in France, it's all there. We offer dance therapy to create empowered uh, women that are going to advocate for peace. We also raise awareness about sexual violence in wartime in the Democratic Republic of the Congo through so a dance show uh, that ends with a debate on how to create peace solution together. So, Basically, that's our definition. And for us, the, the, the artist's role is very, very important in the society. And that's why we, we definitely create our association. And today we use uh, the arts, the dance, to, to build another world. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for this beautiful definition. Dr. Sajani, would you say your definition is close to Eloise? Um, I'd, I'd say it's very much uh, aligned with that definition, Eloise. That was a beautiful definition. You know, on, on one hand, I, I would say, of course, we're all artists in the sense that we have the capacity to imagine, the capacity to create, and that when we create opportunities to for people to get in touch with different modes of expression, they can be reminded of that capacity that they have that can maybe be transferred to other parts of their lives as well. But then when I think about the professional artist, of course, I have to, um, I have to create room and, uh, you know, I think that we need to consider, of course, that professional artists give time and space to hone their skills in order to more sensitively use movement, use poetry, use their craft to communicate, to um, visualize uh, what they'd like to be able to represent. And to pick up on something I mentioned earlier, I think that artists often give us um, a way of seeing the world, uh, of seeing things that we don't quite yet have words for, whether that be on stage or in gesture or you know, in poetry or in visual form, that this is something just beyond our reach, that the artists being as sensitive as they are, are able to pick up on and communicate to us. Uh, so as far as the second part of your question, you know, is there a real contribution to be made to society? Absolutely. Uh, I think that we come from a, at least in the Western artistic tradition, there is an age old story of the poet being left outside the city walls, you know, of Homer being cast out of the, of the city because there was fear that, um, you know, that the poet might stir up the fervor of the populace and get them too in touch with their impulsivity and their intuition rather than uh, logic and reason. And uh, I think that it's true that the artist is able to connect both our heads and our hearts, and that can stir up passion. And just because we use art doesn't necessarily mean it will be used for good uh, in the sense that, you know, we take a look at the Nazi regime in World War II and the arts were very much used as part of propaganda. So they are a powerful tool and uh, reliant on the ethics um, of the artist as well and of, of the group that's using these forms. Uh, but absolutely, there's a contribution to be made to society because uh, we have multiple modes of expressing ourselves and we need to value all of them. Thank you very much. So there is a real responsibility, a social responsibility to call yourself an artist. And now yet, maybe you can tell us uh, if this is your way of defining an artist. Do you really feel uh, socially responsible of relaying uh, the traumas of the Rohingya population, for example? What is your definition of an artist? <laughs> Uh, contributing uh, his art in peace building. For example, in camp, uh, in Rohingya refugee camp, most of Rohingya come from the different traumatic uh, background, different history, and they have uh, and, uh, they have several decades of uh, terrific uh, memory, and they are suffering. They suffer uh, different type of different type of horrible thing. So, if uh, he show his art with them and if he, he, he draw some of the memoir ancient theme and people get some of the stress level reduced, people can good, can reduce and people can bring uh, resilience when peace builder show this picture to them and people uh, somehow see a lot of a story in this team and they are actually most of the non-Babel uh, non -babel story in most of people when Anayat uh, give his uh, art and people could uh, could express uh, his uh, their unbabel intangible uh, intangible uh, story and secondly in another type of gender based violence and other type of violence and other other type of uh, domestic violence and it also contributes his art his, his art uh, in this situation this is for for the first question Thank you. Thank you so much, really, Atarat, for uh, the translation. And thank you, Anayat, for the beautiful answer you're doing. Dr. Molika, what's your definition of an artist, please? Well, I want to thank our artists here. We have three artists here. and uh, But I'm going to take a slightly different approach, if I can, looking at 
the cultural production of art, both historically and by everyday ordinary people today. And I'm going to give two examples of that from Cambodia. So uh, Fanny, if you could show the first slide of Angkor Wat. You know, we believe we stand on the shoulders of the great ones, our mother, a father, our, uh, our uh, great grandparents, our ancient people, you know, and if you look at here with these beautiful scenes from Michael Watt, you know, unfortunately, cultural, a lot of violence and, and the lack of peace building is due to the problem of humiliation and cultural annihilation that vi violence is used like in Ukraine to culturally annihilate a people like in Ukraine. Uh, they're destroying the museums, they're destroying UNESCO sites. ISIS did this, destroying the ancient Roman ruins in Palmyra, destroyed Nivea, the beautiful Mesopotamian uh, temples in, in Nivea, you know, um, going back to the Assyrian regime. And when we built our clinic, in Cambodia 26 years ago, the local people didn't know that these huge giant healing scenes were on the scenes of Angkor Wat. Now, is this art? Yes, it is. Was it done by ancient people? Yes, it was. And look at this, a male traveler seeks shelter, rest, rejuvenation. I, I wish I could do this. I wish I could be an artist who could express this next one. A woman of nobility. These are huge carvings on the sides of Angkor Wat that most of the people, local people, didn't know existed. A woman in nobility comforts a young man in distress and demonstrates compassion and care. Next slide. Pregnant woman with a strong abdominal pain is being helped by a midwife and three assistants. Isn't this gorgeous? These are gorgeous scenes. Next one. And in a waiting room of a medical clinic, an ordinary person and a princess wait to see the doctor. You know. So in our, we discovered in our communities, wherever we work, that people were not in touch with their own artistic history. Can you imagine that? You know, and, and especially the young people in Boston who came from Cambodia. They, they didn't want to be associated with Pol Pot. They didn't want their whole identity to be Pol Pot genocide. So we taught them the ancient history and the arts of their culture. But also we did something very different. Can you show the shadow puppets? Everywhere we work, we work with puppets, puppeteers, local puppeteers. Now, the Khmer Rouge annihilated and killed the Cambodian puppeteers and killed the shadow puppets that was part of the ancient tradition of command. Can you imagine terrorist people annihilating cultural arts done by the people? And we brought back to life the, next slide. We brought back to life the Cambodian puppets in Cambodia. Now all over Cambodia, these puppets are in local villages. Look, look how gorgeous. Now, would you say these are the arts? Are these artists who make these puppets? Are these artists who perform these puppets? I would say they are. And the children sit around, play the gamelan, and then they have this dancing. And we have used this puppetry to promote peace building, justice. We, we have puppet shows that show domestic violence and, and talk against domestic violence, et cetera. And the last thing I want to say is that we know that, for instance, um, and I know our, our people from the Congo, et cetera, they noticed that women like in 19, uh, during the Pinochet regime, uh, the women did the ARPA leaders, you know, and they, they embroidered scenes of torture, murder, you know, they, they, they had a secret um, embroidering effort that went on uh, in, in, uh, with the Arpalias. It went on from 1973 to 1990. And the women, um, just like uh, with the Cambodian puppets, 
put all of the history, justice, and everything into their embroidery. And uh, all over the world, you know, wherever we've worked, we try to find these women. We find try to find the local artists. We and we try to find the puppeteers. We're really big on now. We now we're we, we formed a relationship with a Syrian Armenian woman who's bringing back the puppetry she found in Aleppo in her great grandfather's uh, basket from uh, 250 Muslim puppets from the Ottoman Empire. And she's bringing this back to speak about the Syrian violence. Can you imagine wow. that? That's the arts. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yes, anyway, this is... so, so I wanted to leave you with this image uh, of these wonderful puppets. Now, be leery of the puppets because they're, you know, the pu puppets tell the truth, like the women tell the truth with their embroidery, they tell the truth to power. And puppets in, in uh, Asian society, like in Indonesia and Cambodia, were uh, a link between uh, heaven and earth. In other words, they lived in that zone between heaven and earth. And in all of these societies, why they were destroyed by the Khmer Rouge is because the puppeteers and the puppets would speak out truth to power. And now they're doing it again around peacekeeping justice. And so around the Hun Sen government, which is a dictatorship, you know. Anyway, the, I, 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 um, I love the local arts. I love the local people and the beautiful work that they do. These are the unsung heroes of mm -hmm. uh, the art world, you know. Yes, I love this. Uh -huh. Definitely those kind of uh, common heroes um, and artists also being free of talking about politics and talking about, uh, you know, all those relationship to power could definitely say a lot. And thank you very much for, for sharing those, uh, this puppet art. And I'm going to the last and ultimate question to all of you. Thank you very much. We wish we could have more time. But I would like to ask uh, um, Dr. Sajani, uh, what type of tips could you give to peace builders in order to develop their creativity? We saw earlier that you were uh, into uh, theater art and drama therapy with, uh, of course, multiple initiatives you're doing, but among them, the NYU program you're dealing with. So what type of tips could you give to peace builders? Um, well, if we begin with the notion that we all have the capacity for peace building, that we might have an opportunity to engage in our own artis artistic practice. So the first tip would be encouragement to engage in our own artistic practice, to deepen our own sensitivity to ourselves and the world around us, um, to deepen our empathy and capacity for empathic connections. And I would say, you know, from a research perspective, that we know, uh, I will share very briefly here, the um, we, this is a, a document that I worked on together with WHO Europe and Culture Action Europe and some colleagues at University College London and uh, uh, Oxford University on the health benefits of the arts for people who are forcibly displaced. And I just want to say that we, we do know we have the evidence that demonstrates that the arts can improve our physical, mental and social well-being. So peace builders have an opportunity to acknowledge and act on that evidence base and to make use of and partner with artists and creative arts therapists in their efforts and also to acknowledge the role of the artist uh, in the peace building process. Thank you so much. Uh, talking about WHO, it's a very important thing since uh, with Eloise, we are trying also to have the state involved dealing with art therapy and especially the therapy of movements. And uh, Eloise, uh, could you give us uh, some tips, you know, uh, for peace builders developing their creativity? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's quite the same. It will be like explore and be aware. I think that 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 the thing very important for us to be aware, aware of what's going on uh, in, in, in all over the world and find the way we can definitely um, be involved in some action uh, and in some arts. And like this, we can definitely do something and read, uh, go to workshop. Uh, we try in France to, 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 to offer a lot of workshop of women to meet a lot of, of hospital, of association. And I think that's, uh, that's definitely a good way. And speak about uh, the, research, the research, sorry, um, in 
at LOBA uh, since uh, September 2021, a PhD student in clinical uh, psychology is conducting a three years thesis on our therapy recreation. So the goal is to evol evaluate, adjust and validate our therapy. So um, uh, the articles um, that's going to, 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 be, to be on, uh, in a month uh, and after in a year and two years, uh, we help uh, definitely people to, to know better um, the, the goal of arts in therapy and in mental health. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Eloise. Enayet, uh, Enayet, what type of tips could you give to peace builders right now regarding, uh, you know, this notion of using arts to make peace in the world? <laughs> And it is giving a strong uh, tip for the peace builder and in complex, any complex resolution, uh, in any complex uh, negotiation process, uh, art, like some of the historical things which are not uh, preserved uh, as an ancestral thing, and this type of thing he have, he have articulated, he has art, partially art, so this type of picture can, uh, can use. And secondly, in whenever people uh, feel, whenever people have stress and people have different type of traumatic movement, uh, this type of, uh, this art can use as a therapy uh, for those people. And for resilient, this uh, this type of uh, art also can use. And like he have uh, he have uh, draw a lot of uh, a lot of thing of Myanmar. Like uh, many people lost many thing they are belonging and. Uh, when these things are shown to them, they will remember, and th uh, they will they will remember, and they will uh, also not forget uh, what they had in Myanmar. Because uh, now all the villages and all the uh, British and all are burned down in Myanmar, so there is nothing left, and all become abuses. So that when I and I uh, add show to people, and they will gain all the memory of, for example. In there is a, one of the Rohingya cultural memory center in Bangladesh refugee camps, and there are a lot of a, a lot of art and drawing of NIF uh, in art and in, in art and tradition. He has a lot of contribution, and this type of image also uh, his builder can use for uh, to to spread peace for the peace process. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for this uh, sharing. Dr. Molika, you will be uh, having the final word of uh, this roundtable regarding some tips you would like to share with us uh, for peace builders to be more creative. Well, I, I, I can't say that peace builders aren't creative. I mean, I, I don't see what they're doing in Ukraine, so I'm a little bit discouraged there, you know, uh, that they haven't ended the war there for us. Um, I, I would say that there's a challenge we all have uh, between the professional arts in the West that's caught up with power, prestige, and money, big money, and uh, really conceptual art, which I can't stand, you know, most conceptual art I can't stand, because we're in an apocalypse. Let's get real here. Our country, our world is going down the drain. And these uh, jokes in art are not a joke anymore. They're not funny. And people are making millions out of the new, you know, internet art and everything. I, I can't, it, to me, it's shocking. When we need to support the local people, the craftspeople, the women doing embroidery, the dancing you guys are doing, the beautiful dancing, the drum. Yeah, we're, our attention and money is going to the wrong place. And I, I think we got to, you know, do a complete 180 degree turn and focus on the little people, the little artists who in every culture make my life and the life of their family, their community, whether it's in America, whether it's in the people of color, whatever. You know, where would we be in a world where 
we don't have these people, our brothers, our sisters, our colleagues, our neighbors, creating beauty in our lives. That's the bottom line. So I, I don't I don't go to any more crazy art gallery shows and anything else. I don't care about them. They don't interest me. I got that you're not really into the NFT initiative. No, it, it's just that I, I I see every day the enormity problem. My 80, 90 million people displaced, climate change, ecocide, mass violence in Ukraine. We got to take this seriously and not, you know, not go off and continue to act like business as usual. We're, we're, we're dealing with some heavy, heavy crises today. I wouldn't call it, call it an apocalypse, but we're getting close to one. And we need, we need really um, to step up as artists uh, like you guys are doing the beautiful, wonderful work you're doing. I love it. You know, and we, we need to support the little people. I hate even using that term because I think they're the big people. We need to support the big people. I love that. So, you know, we need to support the big people. Yes. Like, so, uh, like this wonderful artist, Rohingya artist, the wonderful work in the Congo, Misha's before. Anyway, I'm sorry for making this kind of emotional statement, but you know, I, um, I, I really think um, the professional art world has failed us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malika. Thank you, all of those wonderful panelists. Uh, thank you for being here, for discussing this very important matter. Thank you, Dr. Sajani. Uh, thank you, Eloise and Nayet, for being here. Uh, this roundtable about this uh, question that is crucial, you heard it. Uh, the role of the artist in peace building is ending. To conclude this roundtable, let's hear a beautiful poetry from Ataram regarding what he's living right now at Cox's Bazaar. Ataram, floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Ataram from Myanmar. Uh, currently, I live in Bangladesh. It's been five years I'm living here. And I work as a social worker and peace builder. And I, I'm also, I also write a poem in my free time, and it gave me uh, it gave me pleasure and resilience. It also helped me to, uh, to reduce my stress level. So I write my poems. And now I would like to uh, recite one of my poems. It's about my governor. My governor, you hurt me for decades. The highest refugee reside in me now. A dream of Johnny. The highest refugee reside in me now. A dream of Johnny not taken. It told on my history that I have to reveal. The space I am crawling is a land free of water, but I am drum, drowning where it is in my own pin. A store for 100 years received from my governor. The hill rarely grew and the river flowed dry. I am still alive despite you pressurize on me. No matter how much you kill with weapon, I still received my word. Walking with a lamb, lighting the darkness, calling down the torment. Oh, my governor, I still care you to contrast. Rather, you had Leslie murder a million. As a planter, I want to see wall in favor of a green roof to make a stately home. The white weave of excitement, the forest brazen of happiness, the end of bloodshed, cross on the day, it is the 4th of January and the prestigious day. Thank you. <laughs>